Today I'm going to be reading uh, the introduction for Jackson Rising. And I, I might I might read more chapters in, in, in this book as I'm part of a reading group that's going through it. Um, it's called Jackson Rising, Redo, Lessons on Building the Future and the Present, edited by Kali Akuno and Matt Meyer, Cooperation Jackson, forward by Richard D. Wolfe. And uh, Chris Hedges said, the, Jackson is one of the epicenters of resistance for all of us to emulate. This book lays the scene. So it's a pretty important book. Here's a forward by Richard D. Wolfe. <clears throat> Every economic system in human history displays this pattern. It is born out of a prior system. It evolves and then it dies, giving way to the next system. Modern capitalism, the dominant system in today's world, was born in England in the 17th century, spread globally, has changed over time, and is now declining. In its uneven process of dying away, capitalism is also giving birth to new and different systems. Cooperation Jackson is one of those. Capitalism often grew out of the declines of the slave and feudal systems that preceded it. The master and slave economic systems usually lasted for centuries, but then unevenly broke down. Sometimes, when breaks happen in particular places and at particular times, some masters and or slaves would not or could not or would not stay within that system. Instead, they struggled to survive by finding or inventing and then developing some new economic system. In one possible outcome, those refugees from slavery became instead employers and employees in a system we call capitalism. The same story applies to feudalism. Its lord and serf system declined and eventually broke down unevenly in different places and at different times. The ex-lords and ex-serfs sometimes groped their ways into the capitalist system as employers and employees. Now it is capitalism's turn to decline and slowly and unevenly. That process has already been underway for some time in the old centers of capitalism. Western Europe, North America, and Japan. In particular moments and in particular places, people caught in capitalism's deep economic and social difficulties struggled, found, and developed an alternative non-capitalist economic system, one that was not capitalist in the precise sense of not organizing the production of goods and services in enter enterprises characterized by a small minority of the employers who owned and operated them. Unlike capitalism, the alternative system did not position the majority within enterprises the ex-employees as non-owners and pure order takers. Instead, the alternative system effectively democratized enterprises and made them into democratically operated workplaces. In them, all were workers, each with one vote, that made all the basic decisions, what, how, and where to produce and how to dispose of the output. Collectively, the workers became their own employers. Such a, tra such a transition from capitalism to what we call a worker cooperative-based economic system was a modern analog of the various traditions from feudalism to capitalism in earlier times and places. So, for example, in poverty-stricken northern Spain during the 1950s, a Catholic priest and his parish rediscovered and repurposed an old ideal into an economic, a new economic system. They experimented with democratic worker cooperatives as a determinedly non-capitalistic workplace organization, grounding a new economic system. The Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, MCC, came to be its name as a move from an initial six-person worker co-op to the huge corporation that it is today. Encompassing many diverse worker co-ops, MCC is one of Spain's 10 largest corporations. Different worker co-ops developed elsewhere in different conditions of capitalist difficulties and declines. A third of the economy of the Italian Emilia uh, Romagna region is constituted by worker co-ops that have coexisted with capitalist enterprises for decades. The co-ops are networked in ways that provide both mutual support and an effective mechanism for growth. An example in the United States saw the Cheese Board in Berkeley, California, start as a worker co-op in 1971 and grow into six worker co-ops in the San Francisco Bay Area today. The United States Federation of Worker Cooperatives, formed in 2004, was a milestone, furthering the development of worker cooperatives across the country. There are many more examples that reflect both capitalism's deepening problems and crises and the rising attraction of worker co-op based economies as the alternative being born out of capitalism's decline. Cooperation Jackson is one of these key historic pioneering experiments. Cooperation Jackson is founded in this constructing a better economic system and a better society out of the failures, breakdowns, and decline of capitalism. Because of the U.S.'s particular mix of a capitalist economy and a systemic racism targeting the African American community, Cooperation Jackson is a unique experiment in worker co-op based economic and social development. It aims both to overcome the racist victimization of African Americans and the economic victimization that capitalism imposes on employees. 
It is a quiet social revolution underway to move the African-American community forward, economically, politically, and culturally. In so doing, its models crucially lear- it, it models crucial learning and leadership for all employees in the U.S., the vast majority who need, likewise, to find a way out of and beyond capitalism, one that is better. Two, it is understandably difficult for many living in a dying system to understand or admit what is happening. History provides us with countless examples of people denying the declines of the Greek, Roman, and British empires, and now the U.S. empire. Those past imperial systems had looked so powerful and so invincible for so long, yet all of them disintegrated and gave way. Modern capitalism arose in Europe out of the disintegration of feudalism, signaled by the Black Death pandemic of the 14th century. The violent French and American revolutions were feudalism's end and capitalism's birth. Yet contemporaries rarely recognize the signs. Likewise, in a day's decline of capitalism, few see them. The beneficiaries of ongoing systems are usually the most blind. Feudal lords thought the system would go on forever. The wealth and power they amassed provided the props they needed to believe their own hype. Capitalists today are blind in just the same ways. Their accumulated wealth and power, from mansions and yachts to nuclear missiles, comforts them into imagining that their system will not disintegrate, like all former systems did. The COVID-19 pandemic ought to suggest a historical parallel to world capitalism. With the Black Death signaled from feudalism, COVID-19 signals about today's capitalism. With all its wealth, power, and nuclear missiles, capitalism was far more vulnerable to, unprepared for, and deeply damaged by the pandemic than capitalists imagined it would be. Systemic, deep, and recurring flaws and weaknesses were exposed. Millions began to grasp emotionally, ideologically, and pragmatically that capitalism has become a failed system. When systems decline, their victims usually feel and then see it before their beneficiaries do. That is one reason the beneficiaries devote so much of their wealth and energies to persuading the victims that criticisms of the system are wrong and that decline is definitely not happening. The beneficiaries denounce critics of the system as evil, perverse, disloyal, and deserving punishment by the police and army. Those atop the system seek to convince everyone, themselves included, that the system is the best humanity can achieve. It is likewise too strong and solid to ever be undone. Systems last so long as the mass of their victims accept their beneficiaries' views. When slaves, serfs, and employees stop accepting what masters, lords, and employers say about the system, decline sets in. How long the decline lasts, what particular form it takes, and what sparks its final collapse depend on the particular conditions and traditions of each decline's time and place. U.S. capitalism's decline is now well underway. Its basic economic institutions, corporations, are in greater debt than at any time in the system's history. The U.S. government owns more of that debt now than ever before. More of the purchasing power of consumers on which corporations depend, likewise, depends on the U.S. government doling out tax breaks, welfare payments, mortgage loans, guarantees, forbearance, rent moratoria, student loans, and so on. The U.S. government now imposes tariffs, bans, and sanctions on countries and corporations to shape and control world trade. Its central bank floods the economy with trillions of in new money to lubricate a capitalism now on state life support. The myth of private capitalism's invincibility is smashed. Its corporations and its working class are as desperately reliant on government support as the poor are on welfare. As people see that, the inevitable question will arise. If we are all on government support, why are some so much richer than others? The government is a social institution that dispenses society's money. We should all have a say in how that is accomplished. Why should private individuals unaccountable to society make key decisions? What to produce, what technology to use, where to produce, and what to do with the output? When society as a whole makes production possible? At first, such questions arise unconsciously. The decline eventually brings them consciousness, which in turn deepens the decline. When victims of the system's decline become the system's conscious critics, the decline accelerates. Private U.S. capitalism has failed to cope with its economic problems. All capitalisms have for centuries experienced downturns, crashes, recessions, depression, bursts, etc. on average every four to seven years. The U.S. had the dot-com crash in 2000, the subprime mortgage crash in 2008, and the COVID-19 crash in 2020. Three crashes in 20 years. Each crash was worse than the one before. More workers unemployed, more businesses reduced or destroyed, more public budgets and services undermined. The latest crash began in February 2020, before the pandemic hit. 
No real solution to capitalism's instability and its immense social costs has been found. As we go through, its, through this latest one, more and more of us see the systemic problem. <clears throat> U.S. capitalism has failed to correct its ever-deepening inequality of income, wealth, and power. Even during, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, a crisis we, we all had to get through together, quote-unquote, the richest got much richer while over 50 million U.S. citizens filed unemployment compensation claims. I've been waiting for mine for six months now. The inequalities that helped bring about the three crashes of this new century were worsened by those crashes. The problem is the system. U.S. capitalism's economic failures are now reigniting its long accumulated social failures. Chief among these are the systemic racism, sexism, sexism, and ecological destruction that have characterized U.S. capitalism from its beginnings. It is becoming ever harder to deflect oppositions to them to deny or rationalize them, or to postpone solutions. Capitalism's decline also expands majority sympathies for real solutions to those social failures. The critics of capitalism are growing in number, in organization, and in self-confidence. These are all effects as well as signs of, systems, of system decline. Opposition to capitalism as a system is slowly but steadily displacing the Cold War fetish of thinking only piecemeal reforms are needed or possible itself an ideological concession to capitalism. Equally important, the critics of capitalism are finding ways to engage and share with the system's victims. The victims can and do develop the critics' understanding and vice versa. Their growing alliance both reflects and deepens capitalism's decline. Part three. Regarding the birth of a new or next system from the decline of the old, what comes after capitalism? To answer that question underlines the enormous importance of Cooperation Jackson today, its achievements, and its promise. Cooperation Jackson is one birth of the next system within a declining capitalism. It gives not only hope for capitalism's victims and critics, it also provides an intense social laboratory for everyone, participants and observers, to learn what to do and what to avoid in making such births successful. Of course, capitalism always had from its beginning victims and critics, but during the system's long ascendancy in replacing feudalism, slavery, and other prior systems, Victims and critics were successfully suppressed, deflected, or absorbed. This was true both in capitalism's early years and in its later, more recent times. The most important tradition of criticism and opposition has proven to be socialism. For so, uh, first, socialists were the dominant movements of critical opposition within national capitalisms and even of opposition to capitalism internationally. After the short-lived Paris Commune of 1871, when many crucial lessons were learned, Socialists in the Soviet Revolution of 1917 began a several decade long experiment birthing a new post capitalist system as they understood it. Beside the Soviet Union, those experiments included many Eastern European nations, the People's Republic of China, Cuba, Vietnam, and others. Like the earlier Paris Commune, those experiments also yielded crucial lessons, the co and Cooperation Jackson's program learned them. That is one important reason why it can counter declining capitalism and escape from its repeated failures to bring genuine economic development to the Jackson, Mississippi area. Thus, Cooperation Jackson builds its economic development strategy around raising the economic, political, and cultural level of life for the whole of society. It does not prioritize an employer minority as capitalist development projects do. Likewise, Cooperation Jackson is determined not to repeat or allow the, statist, the statism of the early socialist experiments. Cooperation Jackson is relentlessly democratic. Its economic basis is not enterprises divided into employers and employees, the capitalist model. The economic basis for Cooperation Jackson is the worker cooperative, the, deliber the deliberately democratized enterprise. For Cooperation Jackson, the democratized enterprise, the worker co-op, becomes the economic partner for democratized politics and culture. The point is to mobilize democratic participation across the entire community. Where the, social social, where the socialist experiments over the last century focused on government, the ownership of property and means of production, social versus private, the means of distributing resources and products, market versus planning, Cooperation Jackson concentrates elsewhere. The social relations of production inside the enterprise become one key focus. Those have finally to change from the patterns of the past, the master versus the slave, lord versus serf, and the employer versus the employee. Instead, Cooperation Jackson prioritizes enterprises in which all are individually employees, but also co collectively their own employer. The workers have no masters, lords, or employers over them. Unlike the socialist models, state officials have not replaced private citizens as employers. 
that only changes who the employer is. Cooperation with Jackson changes much more than that who. It alters the relationship inside the enterprise itself. No minority owns or controls the enterprise. Instead, it has become a de- Instead, it has become a democratic workplace community. I can tell already he's taking more of an anarchist slant. As a capital, as a uh, communist, that's what I hope communism ultimately looks like. Uh, most good communists, you know, we want to see a communism that looks like anarchism, where there's just like maximum power, minimum waste, overproduction, overconsumption, overextraction. And at the same time, community grounded creativity. <clears throat> Anywho. What Cooperation Jackson is doing widens the space for a worker co-op sector of the U.S. economy. As Cooperation Jackson grows and builds mutual support networks with other worker cooperatives, the U.S. will become economically diverse. It will include democratic worker co-op enterprises alongside and interacting with top-down hierarchical capitalist enterprises. All Americans will thus be able for the first time to directly observe and compare the alternative types of enterprises. So optimistic. As if the capitalists of power won't crush this. Let's read on. That's why communism is a, a stronger response. Especially given the short window we have to extract control from the capitalists before climate change, change leads to a cascading, uncontrollable uh, mass extinction event. What Cooperation Jackson is doing widens the space. But yes, this is what we want the world to look like. We can do this at the same time while we're fighting the capitalists. What Cooperation Jackson is doing widens the space for a worker co-op sector of the U.S. economy. As Cooperation Jackson grows and builds mutual support networks with other worker cooperatives, the U.S. will become economically diverse. It will include democratic worker co-op enterprises alongside and interacting with top-down hierarchical capitalist enterprises. All Americans will thus be able for the first time to directly observe and compare the alternatives. All will be able to buy from, sell to, and work in both types, or they will have families and friends who do. Real knowledge and real comparisons will form America, will inform Americans and thereby give them real freedom of choice. All Americans will then be able to choose what mix of the two types of enterprise they prefer for the U.S. The leadership and model that Cooperation Jackson can provide will stimulate workers and some employers, too, inside capitalist enterprises. to uh, convert them into worker co-ops. Mutual support among them will facilitate the sector's growth and thus the entire economy's diversity. Worker co-ops will inevitably discover that their prosperity and growth are hampered by all sorts of existing laws, regulations, and customs. Uh, most of those need to be changed. How do you expect to do that? The power of the people. They were developed and revised continuously over the last two centuries by capitalist enterprises seeking to make them serve their interests. Capitalist enterprises support those parties and politicians that best serve their interests. Capitalists funded them, supported their projects, and provided vital links to voters in their communities. As worker co-ops gain a foothold within economies where capitalism long prevailed, as in the U.S. today, they will encounter, encounter laws, regulations, and customs that do not help worker co-ops prosper and grow. Some directly prevent and others threaten worker co-ops and their growth. What worker co-ops need now is what capitalist enterprises already have, new or changed laws, regulations, and customs that support forming, running, and growing worker co-ops. To get them, worker co-ops will need a political movement active in their communities, politics, and culture. Worker co-ops will need political parties to achieve for them what today's major parties have long achieved for capitalist enterprises. New political parties responsive to worker co-ops' needs and aspirations will need to work out compromises with the old parties and the capitalism they represent. Really? They also need to renegotiate those compromises we needed to accommodate the shifting balance between capitalist and worker co-op sectors of the national economy. Cooperation Jackson represents a bold, courageous commitment to not be taken down with capitalism's decline, to not resign a community's hopes and dreams to poverty and hopelessness. Cooperation Jackson dares to build an altogether different and far better system than what the capitalist U.S. offers and has always offered. That is what the people of Jackson need. It is also what what so many other Americans need. It's an honor for me to write this introduction to a book devoted to one of our best hopes today for new and better post-capitalism and the genuine economic and social development it can bring. Um, as a Maoist, I, I, I do think it's worth 
doing what they're doing and how they're phrasing um, things in the most basic terms of their material conditions. And that's one of the things that Mao actually emphasized. Um, okay, introduction. Building economic democracy to construct eco-socialism from below. Uh, this is the this introduction is by Kali Akuno and Sakajewia Saki Hao Hall. <clears throat> In a small corner of Jackson, Mississippi, a scrappy little project is striving to make a big impact in the prefigurative development of the next socioeconomic system that will help guide humanity's continuing evolution and transcend the oppressive and exploitative capitalist social order now threatening humanity and all complex life on our precious planet with extinction. Okay. I like how they start by just saying it. This project aims to synthesize the practices and institutions of the social and solidarity economy in combination with permaculture design, digital fabrication, and energy democracy, thus establishing economic democracy on a municipal level to inspire and help build eco-socialism from below on a national and international level. The name given to this scrappy little project is the Jackson Cush Plan, and the organization leading its advancement is Cooperation Jackson. What you might ask is eco-socialism. Oh, sorry. What you might ask is what you might ask is eco-socialism, and why is Cooperation Jackson aiming to build it? I like eco-socialism. Loosely defined, eco-socialism describes a class, a classless socioeconomic system in which humans live in balance with nature. Exchange value would be subordinated to use value by organizing production primarily to meet social needs and the requirements of environmental protection and ecological regeneration. To build an ecologically rational society along these lines requires a collective ownership of the means of production, democratic planning to enable society to define the goals of production and investment in a new technological production structure that meshes with society's plans and stays within the Earth's ecological carrying capacity. And how are you going to do that without revolution? I'm going to read on out of curiosity. To build an ecologically rational society along these lines requires a collective ownership of the means of production, democratic planning to enable society to define the goals of production, investment, and a new technological production structure that meshes the society's plans and stays within the Earth's ecological carrying capacity. Just say it once again. In turn, building such a democratic culture necessitates the transformation of social relations, particularly those of production and reproduction, through deliberate and intentional struggles to eliminate white supremacy, settler colonialism, imperialism, patriarchy, heterosexism, speciesism, speciesism, and all systems of domination, oppression, hierarchy, extraction, and exploitation. There it is. All right. However, before we get to eco-socialism and the overarching challenge ahead, we must first establish concrete examples of economic democracy. So what is economic democracy? In short, it is the democratization of our economy's basic production structures. This transformation starts with the dem democratization of our workplaces, the institutions of finance and investment, and the distribution of goods and services within the market. More specifically, economic democracy calls first and foremost for transforming our workplaces into worker cooperatives. We must break capital's stronghold on the institutions of finance and investment by establishing capital controls and creating such institutions as public community banks. At the same time, we must struggle to bring investment institutions under democratic control, particularly on the local level through practices like participatory budgeting in the public arena. Economic democratization also entails expanding the practices and institutions of the solidarity economy and the commons, whether through community land trusts, time banking, community currencies, solidarity markets, or other means. With these basic definitions and parameters in mind, the question becomes how to move from our immediate short-term democratic economic pursuits toward our comprehensive long-term pursuit of economic democracy. Making Jackson a comprehensive transition city through the agency of our Jackson Trust Transition Plan is our strategy, one we hope also speaks to other communities trying to make this historical transition. To fully grasp 
Our program and strategy is critical to understand Cooperation Jackson's reason for being and our emerging structure. Over the course of our first five years from May 2014 through May 2019, Cooperation Jackson has endeavored to create four interconnected and interdependent institutions. One, a, federal, a federation of emerging local cooperatives and mutual aid networks. Our emerging federation is growing to compromise to comprise a number of interconnected and interdependent worker consumer community cooperatives cooperating as one overall coherent democratic body. We are also constructing various mutual aid institutions and practices to reinforce the federation's solidarity and provide multiple ways to exchange value, labor, and time to improve the quality of life of all federation and community members. Two, a cooperative incubator. Our incubator is Cooperation Jackson's Startup Training and Development Center. The incubator aids new cooperatives with basic training, feasibility studies, business plan development, financing, training, and democratic management, and more. Three, a cooperative school and training center. We are currently aiming to open our economic democracy school in 2022. Our aim is to ensure that Cooperation Jackson serves as a center of social transformation by continually broadening the social consciousness of all its cooperators and enhancing their skills, abilities, and overall capacities to act as conscious actors and improving their social context and environment. For a cooperative financial institution, we're working to build a set of financial institutions that will be used to start and strengthen all Cooperation Jackson operations and serve as a means of self-capitalization uh, and democratic investment to expand the initiative. Um, these, these all seem to have been elements within the Black Panther 10-point program that was also adopted by the White Panthers in Uptown Chicago when, when they were trying to do similar things in the late 60s. All of Cooperation Jackson's programs and strategy are presently executed through five intentionally interlocked, interdependent local points, including various campaign initiatives, projects, and programs. These include the development of self-managed green worker cooperatives and an extensive network of mutual aid and social solidarity programs, organizations, institutions, such as community land trusts. This programmatic approach is translated into transformative policy aimed at making democracy a solidarity city. Two, the development of an eco-village community and energy production and sustainable methodologies and technologies of production and ecologically regenerative processes and institutions. This programmatic approach is translated into transformative policy aimed at making Jackson a sustainable city. So the, the first one was solidarity city, city. The second one is sustainable city. Oh, and the third is fab city. I'll read that. The development of a network 3D print factory that anchor community production cooperatives and institutions. This programmatic approach is translated into transformative policy aimed at making Jackson a fab city or digital fabrication laboratory city. I guess the people are... Hmm. Uh, the next one is a worker city. The development of an all-embracing class-oriented union cooperative to build a genuine worker power from the ground up in Jackson. This programmatic approach is translated into transformative policy aimed at making Jackson a worker city. And then human rights city. The development of a human rights institute to craft a human rights charter and commissions for Jackson. This programmatic approach is translated into transformative policy aimed at making Jackson a human rights city. The transformative policy components attached to each of the focal points are critical since none of the system change processes described here can be sustained in a non-revolutionary context unless the state supports and reinforces them. Such support means providing legal justification, incentives, and resource allocation to various initiatives. It also entails aggressive monitoring and enforcement from municipal government in response to strong social movements and civilian institutions that pressure government. All these transformative policy components are fundamentally, are fundamentally articulations of non-reformist reforms. The notion of non-reformist reforms was formulated by the French socialist André Gors in the 1960s. Gors posed the formulation to bridge short-term engagements for social justice in everyday life with a longer-term vision for an anti-capitalist world. Gors's formulation centers on struggling for demands and reforms that improve conditions in people's immediate lives while subverting the logic of the capitalist system, upending its social relations and diluting its strength. Non-reformist reforms seek to create new logic, new relations, and new imperatives that create a new equilibrium and balance of forces to weaken capitalism 
enable the development of an anti-capitalist alternative. This aim is exactly what Cooperation Jackson's transformative policy components seek to accomplish. The next section is entitled Green Worker Cooperatives, Mutual Aid Network, and Solidarity Economy Institutions. No one practice or form um, associated with the solidarity economy alone can transform the capitalist economy and build economic democracy as a transitional alternative. In our view, we must develop and employ several complementary and reinforcing practices and forms of solidarity eco economics at once to subvert the dynamics of the capitalist system, its logic, and its imperatives. Accordingly, Cooperation Jackson is currently building or aiming to build these complementary solidarity institutions and practices. Um, for one, Community Land Trust. Uh, a community land trust is a democratic nonprofit corporation that stewards and develops land and other community assets on behalf of a community. Cooperation Jackson's primary objective is developing this institution in developing this institution is to acquire and decommodify as much land as possible in Jackson to take it off of the capitalist market. Number two, community saving, lending, and investing. This practice includes community-controlled financial institutions ranging from lending circles to credit unions. We are creating new grassroots funds in our community and supporting several existing ones. The need is to create our own finance capacity, our own finance capacity, given that few traditional financial institutions will lend to poor black people with little no or bad credit. We have borrowed ideas heavily from Spain's Mondragon, um, prioritizing the work of creating a self-reinforcing financial institution to gain maximum control over capital and its deployment for Jackson's collective benefit. Uh, number three, price-based mutual credit. Mutual credit is a form of barter in which a network of creditors and debtors lend to and borrow from each other through various forms of direct exchange and account for the goods and services exchanged. Our model draws heavily on the experiences of the mutual aid network in Madison, Wisconsin. In creating a credit system de denominated in either the national currency or our local alternative currency, our mutual credit system transferable and practical to the community's working class people operates within standard capitalist oriented firms that willingly participate in the practice. Hmm. Kind of like on like Mandalorian, you know, when they're, what are those called? Uh, the Mando coins? Anyhow, time banking. Time banking is a method people can use to exchange services using time as currency instead of money. This practice of valuing everyone's time equally, no matter the task, allows everyone to help produce value in the community and ensures that typically undervalued and or underappreciated skills and services get their due. Our main aim is in building this practice is to elevate women's often unpaid work and to allow those presently excluded from the monetary economy to join the emerging solidarity economy on an equal footing. Yeah, that sounds right. So they can access the goods and services needed to improve their overall quality of life. Posterity but budgeting, interesting. Posterity is personal and community budgeting that explores ways to design and utilize various value exchange options to replace monetary need. This practice helps people to improve their standard of living and quality of life by identifying where, when, and how to use our limited resources to maximum effect. Broadly utilized, this practice helps in poverty's stranglehold on the vast majority of Jackson's residents. Interesting. I guess it'd be kind of like making semi-luxury items available to all on a shared basis. Alternative currency. An alternative currency is any form of currency used as a substitute for the national currency, in our case, the U.S. dollar. In the United States, private individuals, corporations, and nonprofit community institutions create such currencies to counterbalance the standard currency's use. Alternative currencies enhance the market mobility and access of those who, lacking jobs and other sources of income, have limited access to standard currency. Pursuing this practice buttresses our cooperatives and financial institutions and helps our city amid budgetary crisis to support the struggle to retain the black majority and black political power against the pressing threats of gentrification, displacement, and privatization. Tool lending and resource libraries. Tool libraries allow community members to check out or borrow tools, equipment, and how-to instructional materials, either free of charge or for a rental free. Pursuing this practice eliminates aspects of oversaturation and overconsumption in our community, like having too many construction companies and trucks. It gives more people access to critical tools to engage in critical work projects and improve their quality of life. 
Well, this is more when it's shared. Participatory budgeting. According to social scientists Mike Menser and Shucha Robinson, by the way, my, my little Miss, Miss Gruffle's got a haircut. Haircut, look at her, she looks like a little cute little Brayman. She's my little Star Wars companion. Not those crazy ears. Okay, where were we for Gruffle's got so cute? Uh, participatory budgeting. According to social scientists Mike Menster and Jusha Robinson, participating budgeting, participatory budgeting consists of a process of democratic deliberation and decision making in which ordinary city residents decide how to allocate part of a public budget through a series of local assemblies and meetings. Community members determine spending priorities and elect budget delegates to represent their neighborhoods. Budget delegates transform community priorities into concrete project proposals. Public employees facilitate and provide technical assistance. Community members vote on which projects to fund and the public authority implements the projects. When citizens direct municipal budgets and set investment priorities, documented benefits include more equitable public spending, higher quality of life, increased satisfaction of basic needs, greater government transparency and accountability, increased levels of public participation, especially by marginalized residents, and democratic and citizenship learning. In Jackson, we are developing this practice to humanize governance and to institute institutionalize equity processes through governance. It sounds a lot like the stuff that the Black Panthers and the White Panthers did in uptown Chicago when they were making creating people's programs. A lot of people think the Black Panthers are all about fighting and shooting, but uh, defense was, uh, is only like a small part of this, this larger picture in creating a post-capitalist society. And uh, programs for survival for the people pending revolution is the phrase you heard more than anything at their meeting. Um, these folks care about their people. Uh, next bullet point on this was community energy production. Community energy is the cooperatively owned and democratically managed production and distribution of energy from such renewable sources as sunlight, wind, geothermal, and biophotovoltaic, which produce energy directly from plants. Renewable energy can be used for direct consumption and production or can be exchanged on the public energy utility grid for compensation or a financial return to the community. In Jackson, we're developing this practice to reduce our community's carbon footprint to contribute concretely to the development of sustainable energy systems and to create energy self-reliance and self-determination in our community. All right, those are the bullet points. All of these solidarity institutions and practices are in very rudimentary stages of development. As of mid-2019, our main priorities are building three interrelated and interconnected initiatives to incorporate all of these practices and advance economic democracy in Jackson. Oh, interesting. So this book was written before 2019. Yeah, the, the uh, preface was written uh, more recently. It'd be interesting to see what kind of addendums they have since then. First is expanding our community production cooperation cooperative, our light manufacturing, digital fabrication factory, and educational center. Second, creating a model of off-grid sustainable housing, the Ewing Street Eco Village pilot project. Third is laboring through People's Grocery and Food Security Complex to end food apartheid in our community and boost food security in West Jackson. Hard work and ambitions aside, this work to construct economic democracy in Jackson is at best a small step toward an eco-socialist future. Reaching that future. Reaching that will take the agency and collective power of the multinational working class on a global level, building worker-owned and community-owned self-managed cooperatives, organizing worker-led labor unions that own and control the workplaces, and forming people's assemblies in communities or municipalities to deepen democracy. I like that, to deepen democracy. Or, or as my comrades that are stuck in the uh, neo-confederacy like to say, a third reconstruction. Let's see. Part of the larger part of this larger problem must be a plan to reduce the production and consumption of various consumer goods. Your program should also eliminate the planned obsolescence built into the life cycle of all modern consumer products, from cars to cell phones, a practice that enriches corporations and drives resource extraction. This larger program must also expand the production of public goods and services held in common ending the false scarcities that capitalism produces. Designing cities around mass transit could reduce the need for individual cars, 
collective urban farms and edible lawns could ensure greater local food sovereignty while drastically reducing emissions for food, transport, and storage. We must also implement regenerative production standards, replacing extractivist logic with regenerative logic. For every resource we extract and use, we must either replace it or create conditions for it to regrow or regenerate itself. This could mean, for example, planting three trees to, for every tree cut, rehabilitating damaged habitats, and reintroducing species harmed by extractive industries. Given the capitalist system's expansive drive, restoring Earth's natural habitats will be no small feat. In practice, restoration will involve regenerating our soils, massive reforestation, and ocean cleaning projects. The transition to waste-free methods of production, distribution, consumption, and recycling must be front and center in any program of constructing eco-socialism. This shift will be easier if accompanied by local material sourcing, local production, localized supply, and, well, and value chains. We must ramp up recycling, reuse, and composting while reducing downstream waste in landfills and incinerators, both of which release greenhouse gases. We need comprehensive zero waste and recycling processes for all non-perishable products, and producers must bear primary responsibility for compliance. One option is requiring corporations to invest corporations to invest in the production of fully recyclable or reusable products and to fully internalize the costs of including disposable components, say plastic or cardboard wrappings, rather than passing them on to consumers and the public. Some new production methods will require new technology. We need massive public funding for open source research into the development of carbon neutral production techniques for the industrial and consumer goods needed to ensure a high quality of life for billions of people. Several young technologies are headed in the right direction. For instance, digital fabrication, in which computers direct production, allows for decentralized manufacturing and uses far less material than traditional processes. This larger shift in Jackson and the rest of the world will necessitate le uh, learning and incorporating a mixture of indigenous and sustainable methods for production drawn from pre-capitalist cultures. Far from a call to... Wouldn't it be cool, though, if the plastic they used... Uh, in these 3D printers was plant-based and, and like 100% recyclable, so like nothing was ever wasted. You just throw it back in and shape it like something else. I don't know. There's got to be a uh, metal technology solution. Joel Mix. We need you to get on that. This larger shift in Jackson and the rest of the world will necessitate learning and incorporating a mixture of indigenous and sustainable methods of production drawn from pre-capitalist cultures. Far from a call to return to pre-capitalist production, this is a call to press forward with a full range of scientific knowledge that humanity has accumulated. For example, drawing on the more durable and sustainable methods of concrete production used in ancient Rome. <laughs> Touche. Modernism. Or an ecologically sound food cultivation methods from the Incas and Aztecs. To stop runaway climate change and save the species and habitants, habitats that can be, still be saved, we must now fully open our imaginations and dig deep into the reservoirs of our accumulated knowledge to enact comprehensive systems changed over the next 10 to 15 years. Given the tremendous obstacles our ancestors have overcome over the past 200,000 years, from extreme ice ages through super volcanic eruptions into the genocidal spreads of global capitalism, we know we have the capacity to cope and flourish. But will we develop a necess necessary will and organization? Cooperation Jackson believes we can and must, and we are working as hard as we can to play our part in our small little corner of this precious earth. Well, right there in the heart of the Confederacy. All right. That was the introduction. <laughs>